So we, we have been studying for this math exam that I really need to pass. Also, we've done a lot of money and a decent bit of trouble. So I thought to myself, uh, what's the best way to study for a subject than to use cats and cat-like noises to model it? Today's video, I'll be using cat analogies in Sonic Pi, a musical coding language, to demonstrate the basic concepts of math, or algebra. Um, so with no more delay, let's get right into this. To start, I think I should explain how I'm going to be getting Sonic Pi to work with the algebra. If you do not care at all about this, I'll have a timestamp you can jump to so you can get to the cat algebra. So first up, we have forward progress. For this idea, we're going to have x be defined as time, specifically a beat. To handle this, I just wrote a simple Sonic Pi thread that starts from zero and increments by one after each beat, as well as calling another function called y. This y function is where the magic happens. Essentially, I had to create a way to convert the pure outputs of the function into something we can actually listen to. As well as the fact that I want the outputs to vaguely sound cute, means if they didn't, I'd get annoyed very quickly. To do this, I first modified our y value. I did this by setting a minimum note that I'm okay with listening to, and then I added it to the output y value. Then I did a check. If the adjusted y is below the lowest note, still, then the y value is negative, and it shouldn't play anything. Same if the adjusted y value is higher than this highest note I set, because I also don't want to listen to extremely high sounds. And it's within the range, then it will activate a function that will play a beep sound that I thought sounded kind of cute. Finally, I also included a check for zeros. Zeros are very important in a lot of problems in algebra. So if the value of y that is outputted is equal to zero, I have a little cat.wav sound play, as well as an output to the console that we hit zero. Nerd stuff out of the way. Time to get into the cat sounds in math, which totally isn't also nerd stuff. Let's start off with the simplest equations, those being linear functions. These equations are extremely boring, being modeled by y equals mx plus b. When we put this into our handy dandy sound machine, it outputs a beat that is one tone higher each beat all the way until we reach the limit. There isn't much to say about this unimpressive equation. Even me with my infinite cat wisdom doesn't really have any care for them. So I'm going to say we move on quite quickly. Now then, let's have some actual fun here. Parabolas. These curved bastards are what we are here for, not no silly lines, some real math. Exponential equations are going to be what we really sink our teeth into. An understanding of how these equations work is something that the cats can really help with and is really a core part of algebra. So how can we model these equations? Well, there are three main ways, and all three can have their strengths and weaknesses demonstrated by the cats. Let's start with slope-intercept. Slope-intercept form, or ax squared plus mx plus b, is a classic. But what does it mean? Let's think of the strength of this form. It is in this form that if we set x to 0, there will only be one number remaining. This is the y-intercept. What is the y-intercept? Well, in our little sound models, that's going to be the note that the loop will start on when we play the first beat. Another way to think about it is this with cats. If we are standing at 0 and a cat is somewhere in 2D space and it meows, the y-intercept can be seen as the sound of that meow from where we are first standing where the x-intercept is defined as our place. We can change the values of a and m and observe all sorts of changes after the first beat. But as long as b remains the same value, that first beat will always be the same in slope-intercept form. The only way to change the first beat would be to change the b value, and that's kind of useful. Now, slope's out of the way, what about a good old-fashioned factoring? Factoring is fun, I guess. It lets us understand the components that make up the equation, but how can we visualize it? Well, let's use Sonic Pi as an example real quick. Playing the following notes, you will see it starts off silent and then gets higher before stopping and going lower before silent again. This is an upside down parabola, and sound can demonstrate a crucial detail about the factor equation. If we check the output log, the timestamp of the first and the last output were opposite values of the numbers we put in as factor values. This is because those components that would make up an equation can be used to find when the equation would equal zero. As if any one component is zero, then they are all, because zero times zero, or zero times anything, is still zero. If that demonstration doesn't work, another way to think about it is using the cat I mentioned earlier. If at the origin we cannot hear the cat, then if we move towards the cat in steps, the lower value of the factored form would be when we first hear the cat, and the higher value would be when we stop hearing the cat. From there, we can go to vertex form, or the better way to describe it for this video is, where is the pesky cat? The vertex is the epicenter of the function, and the vertex form lets us find it. Vertex form is typically written as y minus the y value equals m times the quantity of x minus the x value. However, in our case, we can only export the y value to the sound machine, 
so we can send the Y to the other side. In this format, we can kind of see how this all works, but if not, do not worry, I have a cat analogy. Let's first find the cat. The negative X value is the best place to start doing this. In the cat's world, its location can practically be seen as the origin. Hey, even earlier, I was defining the origin as your relative location to the cat, to its center, you know? And if we assume that we are not literally the cat right now, and in this case, we must organize a difference between us and the cat's worldview. To do that is very simple. Simply take your current worldview, or the x value, and subtract away the cat's distance from you to find its worldview. If the cat is three feet away, and you walk forward two steps, to the cat, you're one step backwards from it. The parabola works the same way, this x offset defining how far it is from the origin, and it's negative because at the origin, its value is typically modeled as zero, so it requires a subtraction of the modified start point to get to zero. Now from here, we can handle the rest of the equation. Y value when swapped on the other side, in this case, is simply the cat's version of the y-intercept. Rather than the volume from where we begin, it is the volume from where the cat begins, as if such needs to be scaled accordingly to the initial volume or initial value of the vertex. Now, I'd like to go into the quadratic equation. Why? Because I hate it, everyone hates it, it's horrible, but it's got a point. Now, imagine your good friend, Nekoark, hands you an equation for how loud he is going to be some distance away. You, being a normal human, do not want to have your ears explode, so you intend on avoiding the Neko Arc's radius. But how do you know where the radius is? Well, we could try factoring, but Neko Arc's size and distance are both very large, and you'd rather not spend hours testing if factors work when Neko Arc could just blow up your house tomorrow. So, here's the quadratic formula. Essentially, the quadrat will find those zeros at the cost of powering through negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. But that's a lot of numbers. How do they work? And what are you truly finding? Well, avid math nerds, ew, that sentence just made me recoil. Would you notice the cute little plus minus and maybe be able to put some pieces together here? If not, let's address two facts about a squared equation. On first fact, the negative side of a vertex and the positive side of a vertex, the points are mirrored of each other. This is true because negative times a negative is a positive, and a squared function is just the same thing multiplied twice. This means that the zeros of a function are equal distant from each other, and the middle point between these zeros is the vertex. With this knowledge, let's break apart each part of the quadratic equation, or more so rewrite it like this. As you can see, the left side can actually be easily solved out, and doing so, we'll find a number that it can, using our earlier logic, be of some importance. This is where Nekoark is, or the vertex, meaning the other half is just how far away from the vertex we gotta be to find a value of zero, essentially resulting in a weird little factored form. In fact, in my sound implementation of this, I just redirected the solved quadratic into the factored equation to make this out. This video so far has been quite the occurrence, uh, a lot of math, maybe not enough Nekoark and cats, but I've been enjoying it, so why don't we hit two more function types while we're here. First, we have perpendicular functions. These essentially are functions that run completely opposite of each other. Here, I'll let a little sound demonstration of two perpendicular functions demonstrate that idea. And as you can hear, the rate that one went up and the rate that the other went down was equal, but they went in opposite directions. For the cat analogy, imagine the difference like yin and yang, good Nekoark versus evil Nekoark. Two sides of the same coin, similar in many ways, but with opposite goals in life. To close out, though, we have inverse functions. Inverse functions occur when the output of one function, when put into another, results in the initial x. Think of it like a back button or undo. Like, here's my good friend Morbcat. Because he is French, I will put a French flag on him. But if I remove the French flag, that would be the inverse function, as what I did to Morbcat is net neutral. We can demonstrate this in sound, but they work very differently from perpendicular, as not just is the direction different, but also the speed of ramping is entirely different. Here's a short demonstration to really show how opposite a perpendicular, a uh, inverse function is from its norm. Overall, that's all I've got for you. I thought Cat, Sonic Pi, and Morbcat could help me study for this exam, and I hope the auditory demonstrations, visual maps, and cats can help some of y'all grasp these concepts. If not, I hope you at least enjoyed what I put forth before you. But this has been Christopher Beast, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time.